record. Um, you can use the chat tonight to ask questions or we have a rather um, smaller group. So feel free to raise your hand also. Um, and at the end, if we don't get to your questions, we will go through the chat. Also after tonight, if you have questions that were not answered, um, feel free to email anjack at info at anjack.org and we'll be sure to get back to you. Okay, so we're ready to roll. Okay, let me share oh, my screen here. I have one more question for those that I can see, or you can just say it if your mic's on. How many of you have done our site plan program or site plan um, before? Okay, so it looks like we have a lot of new people, which is really good. We've greatly expanded it. And, and in the future, we, um, on the other, we did this Saturday, a lot of people asked that we do more, more of this specific program using other site plans. So we will be, um, we'll, we will be bringing out some additional programs. Okay, Chris. Okay, can you see the uh, site plan here, Cheryl? Yep, I can see it. Okay, here we go, this is the cover sheet. Yep, so looking at the cover sheet, is, senior house, is a senior housing facility consistent with the zoning designation. So first um, we have to find where is where are the zoning designations on the cover sheet. Okay, so let me see if I could zoom in here. Um, so there's a map here, Cheryl, see this map? Mm -hmm. So that can looks... anyone else see the zoning designations? I know it's really kind of hard to read the print. Well, Feel it's free to hard. take your, everyone, if you, if you feel comfortable, take your mutes off, please. So it's hard to see on this map, Cheryl, exactly what the designations are. I see these letters here, you know, LD is one designation. It looks like this crosshatched area is where the site is. So we could probably also go over here to the site data. Every every cover sheet usually has a plan like this. And then it actually tells you what zoning it is in number four. Can everybody see that? Yep. So this looks like it's zoned commercial uh, C-1. Now be careful, C-1 is also a category of, of water that we have in New Jersey. It's highly protected, but some towns actually, you know, use C1 as a commercial zone. Uh, some some use other codes, but it's all it's usually labeled that way. Um, so this is this is what they're actually going to build here. Um, so a senior a senior center is that what this is, Cheryl? Do you yep. know? Yeah. Senior so center. so this is a commercial zone. So do you think a senior center should go in a commercial zone? It's appropriate land use for that. Ugh, depends. Well, actually, we can look at the bottom of this data here, and it says variance is received. And the first variance they received is to permit an assisted living and memory care facility where not permitted in the C1 zone. So what this basically means is this is not permitted in this zone, but they got a variance already from the town to be able to put this here in the zone, okay? And it's important to note that they did not change the zone to right. allow for the senior center. They just gave them a variance for it. Yeah, so so they have to fit, because if they, that's important because if they had changed the zone, the requirements would change, but they're, they're keeping the requirements in place. Well, um, let's look at the requirements, Cheryl. Can we do that? We yep. got them up here. So um, they're typically called bulk requirements. So these are the bulk requirements for a commercial one zone in this town. And it tells you what's required and it's telling you what's proposed. So for example, the first line, we have minimum lot size. You have to have at least a two acre minimum lot and they have 9.638 acres. So they're okay. Um, so we can go through here and you can see which ones actually 
satisfy the requirements, right? Some are minimums, some are maximums. So you have to just be careful when you're looking over here, you know? So can anyone point out one that is not meeting the requirements? Front yard, front yard and the building height. Yeah, front yard and building height. It's actually nice that this this uh, developer, this engineer who did these plans, actually put variance next to it. So mm -hmm. really calls it out for you with a little star on it. That doesn't always happen. Um, sometimes it's just written in there and you have to really be careful in looking at this. But the minimum front yard is 100 feet. They only have 90 feet. And the maximum building height is 40 feet. They have 45 feet. And we can go down and we can see, you know, did they receive variances for that? And it looks like they already received a variance for the building height. That's the second bullet here. And they already received the variance for the 90, 90 foot front yard. Um, so they have 90 feet instead of 100. So they received those already. Now, Chris, have they had to go already in front of a planning board to get those variances before they present the application? They would have gone to the uh, uh, zoning board for okay. that, board of adjustments, maybe, and uh, to get that done. Um, usually, uh, and the environmental commission I'm on, we would usually see this before they went to those boards, and you know, we would comment on the variance. They actually had that in my town. They were putting up solar panels on the back of this uh, commercial lot and the side yard was required to be 50 feet. They were proposing 40 feet and we commented to the zoning board that, you know, we don't believe they should get a variance from that, um, that side yard setback because there's no reason that they can't, you know, com accommodate the 50 feet. And we have, we have variants, we have uh, um, ordinances for a reason. And, um, you know, that we set that to be 50 feet in that zone and they should oblige by that. And they actually went back and they they changed their development. They, they gave us a 50 feet, 50 foot side buffer. So at the last meeting, Chris, somebody had asked the question in one of these breakout sessions. Do you have a good relationship with your planning board? Do you get the applications in a timely manner? And somebody else in the chats came up with a statute that said they only have to give it to us. In with 10 days before its first presentation or before they gave a time limit. Is that the case? That yeah, it's there, just there's, a, there's a certain time limit that you're supposed to have it uh, ahead of time. And then there's, I think there's also a different time limit of where you could submit supplemental information. You know, okay. for example, I, I've been at a, an environmental commission meeting and we've asked a question about, uh, well, you have the, uh, the wetlands letter of intent and the, and the developer had received it. And he said, yeah, I have it right here. And we said, well, we, you can't give it to us. You have to give it to the clerk. And then the clerk has to provide to us. There's a, there's a process there that you have to follow. Um, and then you have to also get that stuff so many days ahead of time. Um, usually we get our, our information at least 10 days ahead of time. Um, and it's not unusual to get uh, some addendment, uh, addendments later on, you know, um, but that's usually what happens. So. You need to have time to look at this stuff, really. Um, I want to spend a couple hours before each meeting going through this. So, so what okay. else, Cheryl? Should we so talk we, about the parking requirements, Cheryl? And we so, already looked at um, question number two. So let's just look at the the impervious lot coverage calculations. Okay, it, let's look it, at that it, because that's important. Is that acceptable? Where is? Oh, yeah. So what's required? 60. 60% 60 they're less. Right, they're well, they're well below. Um, but, and that's great, but that's not the answer to, we have to look at where that impervious cover is going to be draining. And we'll get into that as we move forward. Okay. Is there a requirement too, if a, if a project is going to be giving back space, making it, pervious versus impervious that they do they have to are they required to give the amount of acreage or square footage that they're giving back because we have a program a, a plan right now a development plan here where because they're giving coverage back they don't have to meet other certain requirements for stormwater management and yeah, yet so, they've so, never yeah so the way the way that works is when you do the stormwater calculations it's based on the impervious cover but you look at 
uh, pre-development conditions and compare it to post-development conditions. So in some cases, when you're redeveloping a lot, you may have one acre of impervious cover, but after your, your new development, you may only have 0.8 acres. So um, that gets factored into your stormwater calculation. Okay, so that, that, that's an important thing to kind of, kind of notice, okay? Um, and and that, should be, that should be covered. Your, and usually the stormwater calculations, your town engineer or whoever's reviewing plans on behalf of the town will review and they will provide a comment letter saying that it's, you know, it's meeting the standards and, and things like that. But there's still things that you need to look at as an environmental commissioner. And we'll kind of give you some hints about where developers try to, uh, I don't know, sure, what's the right word? Is the right word cheat? Or is it uh, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe push the envelope? Maybe that's the right word? Is that the... To say yeah. the least, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. another thing is, what's going to happen to where they're giving it back? What is that land going to be um, preserved as open space? Um, yeah. Are you asking me that? No. Yeah. Right, but I mean that's one thing that the environmental commission could be suggesting. You know. Okay. So next question. Check the residential site improvement standards, which is RSIS requirements for parking. So for every different type of uh, building, they have parking requirements. It's usually based on the square footage and the use. Uh, so the, the parking requirements here is for a life care facility is 0.5 spaces per bed. And that's based on RSIS, which is a residential site improvement standards. Those residential site improvement standards tell us how much parking we have to have, um, how wide the roads have to be, um, you know, a lot of different information um, in actually building a development uh, falls into those site improvement standards. Okay, so in this case, in this case, we have 100 beds, so they need 50 spaces, mm -hmm. right? And what do they have? Um, 56. 56. So they're, so they're, they're satisfying that mm -hmm. requirement. Um, as an environmental commissioner, what I look here is if they're required to have 50 and they have 150 uh, or they have hundred or 75, my argument is, well, why do you need that many parking spaces? Mm -hmm. uh, if you can reduce that, we can reduce the impervious footprint. Um, and that, that becomes a really important factor. Or if, or if 25 of those spaces are overflow spaces, Maybe we can pave that with uh, grass pavers right. or some other uh, some other permeable surface that really doesn't look like asphalt or behave like asphalt. Instead, it's let's water kind of pass through it. So that's kind of one thing we, we look at. Um, sometimes when we look at facilities like uh, churches, we try to understand is there opportunities to share parking? You know, if the church is next to a bank, um, you know, maybe there's opportunities to share parking with the bank parking lot at least for overflow parking when you have the, the big church days on Christmas or, or Easter, you know, so there's opportunities to kind of look at that too, uh, make those suggestions. So. And, and also possibility of using uh, porous asphalt in some areas. Right, and we'll talk about that with the stormwater management rules, a little bit more about porous. Okay. You know? so. Um, so have all the required permits been obtained? Now, each plan, each cover sheet usually has on it a list of permits that are needed. And, and here's that, that list for this sheet. I can maybe zoom out a little bit. Oh, I'm not sure I like that zoom. So you guys can see that. Has everything been approved? Um. Yeah. How many, been, how many, <laughs> how many have been approved? What did, what did they have? Uh, three, six, seven, eight there. None. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so this, is this is important, especially where it says to be submitted all these New Jersey DP ones, the wetlands one, um, the treatment works approval one, the water connection one, you know, um, the DOT one department of transportation, um, so all these, um, you know, you, you can provide comments to the planning board on, you know, what you're worried about with some of these, and they'll take that into account when they review the plans later on. Um, but you know what, the one that most alarms us here is, uh, the wetlands one. 
and because they do not have a letter of interpretation yet or any wetlands permit yet. So if there's wetlands on a property, the wetlands have been delineated by the developer. He says this is where the wetlands are. And then he assumes the type of wetlands they are. Are they a, a medium wetland or a valuable wetland? Do they get a 50 foot buffer or 150 foot buffer? So he makes that assumption. And then he designs the development around the assumptions he made, even though New Jersey DEP still has to come out and verify that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and this is the time if the Environmental Commission knows of any special habitat or um, other reasons why these are more significant than, the, than is being shown, this is when you want to get in touch with the DEP. Um, it's the time to be getting in touch with your clerk so that you can get out and walk this property and, and see what's there. And if you have cause for raising issues, you, you need to raise them with the DEP. Okay, so, so now it's I think I think one last thing, Cheryl. It's kind of important to remember that this is a this is a cover sheet for this plan, actually in Evesham Township, uh, produced by this engineering company. They're not all going to look like this. Um, they all may have the same information. It may not be set up exactly the same way, but the information may be here. It may be buried in different places on this cover sheet. So you just have to be very careful when you're reviewing it and try to see where things are. Um, a lot of towns do not have a standard format for a cover sheet. Uh, they let the, the developer, the engineer who's worked for a developer, put this together and submit it and then, you know, make sure all the information is on it because there is a checklist to make sure all the information is there. Okay, and over here on this side is the adjacent property owners. Here's utilities companies over here. You know, so they have a lot of information here uh, on this plan and it becomes an important document. So, and okay, so number two, Cheryl, ready? I, no, wait, can I have a question on this? Okay. Go back to, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, it says color coding. And this yeah, so is that's more something or less, that, yeah, I think yeah. that's something that we added. Um, when I say we, I mean Randy from Anjack. Um, so you'll see in the next couple of sheets, we um, she she highlighted certain areas. Uh, she uses yellow for the wetland boundaries, blue for stormwater management, green for trees, uh, peach or orange for steep slopes, and then red for other features. So as we go to the other plans, you'll see those colors that that. Okay, uh, so that would be uh, that would, the EC would add this. They this it doesn't arrive. Like, yeah, so, so that's I something see. that we added. So when you, you get these plans, um, you know, they, they may not be um, big sheets like Great. this. You know, these sheets are typically printed out 36 inches by 24 inches. Uh, typically, when you get them in the mail from your environmental commission to review ahead of time, they're usually 11 inches by 17 inches. So they're um, uh, even less than half the size. So the font gets very small on them. I actually have, I don't know, you guys can see, I, I, I have a, a, a lighted, um, um, what, what's, what's this called, Cheryl? A scope? A loop. What's that? A loop. Magnifying glass, a lighted magnifying <laughs> glass. So I can see this stuff because I'm old and like, it's hard for me to see. So I encourage you to, to buy one of those, Amazon Prime um, or at your local hardware store. Um, so... This next sheet is what we call existing features. So let's just zoom in on the title block here. I just want to add when your EC is reviewing these site plans, though, you can take highlighters just like Randy did on these. It's a great way to make areas more clear while you're yeah. reviewing them. So, so this is a existing conditions and demolition plan. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what the next sheet usually is. So this is supposed to show everything that's already there. It also flags things that's going to be removed. Okay. Um, there's an important component on this in the bottom here, right? This is your, um, you got two kind of legends down here. You have a zoning legend. So LD is low density C1's commercial. So and you can see right up here, there's a C1. So that area is commercial. We'll show you a little bit more in the plan in a minute. And then over here, we have a soils legend. Um, so you'll have these letters over here, designation on the plan, and this is what type of soil they are. So ATTA is Addison Fine Sand, uh, and it gives you a soil class. 
Now, soil class is important because soils are classified from A, B, C, and D. Just like if you're taking a test at college, a D is very bad soil, an A is a very good soil. So an A is a very sandy soil, infiltrates very well. A D soil is very clayey, shaley, very low infiltration. If it's A slash D, it means the soil is typically a D soil, does not infiltrate very well. But if it's drained, it's an A soil. So some of these places have already been drained, so it can be an A soil. So, uh, so that's something that, that we, we see every once in a while, that the A slash D or the A slash C. Um, so there we go. And then this is the existing features. So what are we supposed to look for here? We're Cheryl, looking to good? see if there's any freshwater wetlands on the property or any streams. Okay. I don't see any streams. Are there streams? Maybe I'll see. Hmm. How about for, I don't see any streams. Are there any freshwater wetlands? Well, I think we can zoom. I mean, well, we, we know Randy colored the wetland line in yellow, right? So mm -hmm. this must be a wetland line. So let's zoom in on that and see if we can see what it says there. Okay. And then we could scan up here. So there's some text here, which is uh, microscopic to me. Um, let's see. Um, and it looks like that says freshwater wetlands. Um boundary line um, were delineated in the field by Marathon Engineering and Environmental Services on July 2nd, 2019, and subject to verification by New Jersey DEP. So this line here, this, this single line, two dots, line, two dots, is the wetlands line. And these little triangles here are points that they actually put flags out in the field. Some wetland scientists went out there. He, he walked around. He delineated that this is the boundary, the edge of the wetlands. This is the wetlands up here, and you can see the little wetland grass symbol they have um, that they have there. But this is the wetlands, and this is the edge of the wetlands. And each one of these marks a surveying point or a flag that they put in to delineate the edge of that wetland. Um, so does that answer your question, Cheryl? Mm -hmm. Does anyone know what they're looking for when they go out in the field, when that, when they're going out to survey it, that's going to give them a clue of where that wetland line is? Muddy boots. <laughs> well, Muddy, well, that's pretty good. That, yeah. <laughs> well, you're right. Apparently <laughs> plants and uh, soil type. Right, exactly. Right. They're, they're looking at the soils, they're looking to see what vegetation's there, and that's, that's how they're marking it. Um, so using the scale, um, which we discussed before is one inch equals 40 feet. 40 yeah. so, feet. so we, we have a scale down here. Okay. And it tells you one inch equals 40 feet. Now, what's important about that is if this plan was printed out 24 inches by 36 inches, one inch would equal 40 feet. But if they send you a reduced size of this, one inch is no longer equal, equal 40 feet. So you have to use this graphical scale, right? So what I typically do is I will lay a piece of paper along this scale here and I'll mark out each one of these boxes. And I would say, okay, this is 40 feet. This is 80 feet, 120 feet. Each one of these lines is 10 feet. And then I can use that little piece of paper to scale my drawing and see how far mm -hmm. things are away. So, these people here decided that these wetlands were not of exceptional value. So they put a 50 foot buffer on them. So that's 1.25 inches if the plan was drawn to scale. But if you laid your graphical scale here, you would see that this is 50 feet from this line to this line. So this is the buffer line that they put here. Now, what's important to note is there's a little pocket of wetlands here. So they have to buffer that too. So the buffer line gets extended all the way down here, 50 feet away from that. So this line at all spots is 50 feet away from the wetland line. Here's 50 feet away from this line here, all the way around, okay? Okay, I just wanna answer, um, Jack, You, I was gonna type it, but we, we should, we hope to finish up at 8.30. We go back into the main room for just like a minute, but if you need to leave, we certainly understand. Um, so, 
so we we already discussed this question. Has the applicant received an LOI from the DEP? No. And we, we know that because he actually wrote it here too, right. subject to verification. So he hasn't received it yet. Um, okay, so the, um, the next question is, what soil types are found on site and is there any concern? And Chris had shown you where the, the listing of their soil types are. So this is one soil type here, ATTA, right? These are the zoning LD and C1. So you can see above this line is, I guess, low density housing and below is C1. So it's a combination of these two lots where we're going to put this uh, senior community. The other soil type is down here, BUKA. Um, so that's another soil type. They had three in this table, but I, I can't find the third one. I looked for it for a while, but it gave me a headache. So I stopped looking. So, um, so that's that's all I saw, Cheryl. Those two. Okay. So, um, so we discussed that. Where are the test pits? So I don't know if we have that in the legend. Okay. Oh, you Wait. know what? I'm sorry, Chris. Go back to that map for one second. So, so if you look over here, they have a legend, right? So. Cheryl said, well, where's the test pit? So I would go to the legend and say, okay, test pits, they look like this, right? You can see that. Can you guys see my hand moving around that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then we can go back here and we could say, okay, here's the, the test pits, right? Mm -hmm. And where are the test pits not? Uh, everywhere else. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And and we'll we'll see why test pits are important in a minute. Okay. okay. Look, looking at this map, what's that peach area with the green next to it? A grade? Was it a grade? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a steep slope there. Yep, it's a steep oh. slope. So whenever contour lines are very close together like that, these are these are considered contour lines. They're lines of constant elevation. So everywhere you see the 91, everywhere along this line, the elevation is 91. Everywhere along this line, the elevation is 90. Everywhere along this line, it's 89. And we know from this now water flows downhill. So water is going to flow from 91 to 90 to 89. So that's important for that. When you have topo lines very close together like this, it's considered steep slope. So this is a very steep area. Okay. So I just want to look one more time. So what were the soils in those basins? So the soils in the basins were the ATTA soil. Right. Okay. And they might be a problem, correct? Yeah, uh, we don't really know. They're A they're A D soil. So they so if they're D, they're probably not very good soils to mm -hmm. infiltrate in. Right. You know? Okay, so. so next we're going to go to the site plan. So next drawing. I mean, the, the great, is this graining, grading and. Yeah. So this is, the, this is called the site plan. And, um, you know, we can see here, um, you know, site plan, it actually shows you what we're going to build here on this site. Right. So we can, we can see this zoom out a little bit. Um, so here we have, you know, this is the, the buildings, the parking lots, the building is here, parking areas around it, you know, so all this is here. Um, these blue squares are stormwater management basins. So this is a basin here, a basin here, and a big basin here. Um, we could kind of zoom in on those basins. And I don't know if this is the first thing we're supposed to be doing, Cheryl, right? I'm not sure. That's okay. I'm, I'm kind of going off script now. That's all right. So, so this basin, it says basin A, and it's not, it, there's a parking lot here. Wait, how could there be a basin in a parking lot? Well, you look at it, it's underground stormwater management facility. So that means they're storing water under the parking lot. Okay. And this the one over here is the same thing. Well, this is two areas where they did soil testing. Mm -hmm. Right. If you go back to the previous drawing that you could see that was a soil testing pits were done here and here. And, and that's important because if you're putting a basin under a parking lot, 
you have to make sure the groundwater table isn't very high. If the groundwater table is high, the groundwater table is going to fill up that basin and it'll have no room for stormwater. So it's very important to look at that soil testing data. Soil testing data will tell you, does the soil infiltrate well? What's the depth of seasonal high water table? Because the water table changes throughout the season. And what we really care about is when it's the highest. Okay, so that becomes important. If it's really high one time a year and we can't get water back into the ground here and these basins become flooded and they don't provide any stormwater storage because they're already filled with groundwater. So that's a big, that's a big issue, okay? So will the transition areas be disturbed in any way? So the 50 foot buffer is considered a transition area around the wetland. So that's this 50 foot buffer. Well, you can average the buffer, right? So you can make in some places, make it 75 feet and other places make it 25 feet. Okay. So there's a little table over here where they talk about that transition table, right? So they have a code here, this, this, uh, this hatching, and this is the reduction area, and this is the compensation area. So in other words, they're reducing the buffer in an area, and they delineate with this, and they're expanding in an area, delineate with this, and they're reducing it by 4,028 feet, or 26, no, 28 feet, and they're expanding it by 4,028 feet. So it's, it's a, it's a uh, straight-up average. So we can go here. And we can see this is the first spot where they're adding area. So they're moving this buffer here and they're pulling it out here. So now this is considered the edge of the wetland buffer. So this is all now added to the transition zone. Now, why did they add there? Well, because over here, they subtracted. This was supposed to be the buffer, but we've got a parking lot in here. So you see all the dotted dots here. This All this area here has been taken out of the buffer. So what's supposed to happen is this area is supposed to equal this area, then you're okay. There's one more area over here where they've done something with the buffer too. It looks like they might have encroached a little bit over here too, but not, not too much. Well, it looks only 444 square feet, but they have all that labeled here. So this is transition where they, they, they took away from it or they added to it, you know, and this one's labeled too someplace uh, or maybe not. No, oh, it's labeled up here, right? This area, and then this area is also labeled. Okay. Are they including any green infrastructure here to try to compensate for what there were areas near the wetlands? Grass pavers, right? Right. Yeah, these grass pavers are real green infrastructure. So they're trying to get water back into the ground in this buffer area. I'm not sure if that's a great place to recharge water in the buffer area because usually it's very saturated, but that might be that might be okay. Um, so, but okay. my main concern is these basins and how high the groundwater table is. And that also pertains to this basin down here where there was no soil testing done down here. So this basin is four or five feet deep. The question becomes is if you dig it that deep, are you digging it into the groundwater table? And is it still going to be a dry detention basin or is it going to be filled with water half the time, which limits the amount of stormwater it can hold? And can't we assume that the town engineer has done all of this for us? Yes, you can. Um, but my experience has been, it's okay to ask these questions. Okay. Um, the town engineer, um, he or she is only human and they, they miss some of this stuff at times. Um, and it's okay to kind of point this out and we'll show you a little bit in a minute about where some of the stormwater flows from these systems and why as an environmental commissioner, I would be concerned about that. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to um, move on. We discussed this a little bit in basin C, what are the elevations? Okay. So, so we need, we want to go to elevations. we got to go to this next drawing here. Okay. So this is your, this is your uh, grading uh, and drainage plan. Okay. And you can see these basins are still delineated. And what Randy had done was she actually took a dark blue line. She marked where the pipes are going or, or leaving the basin and coming into the basin. Okay. So, uh, so that becomes uh, an important factor that we need to look at. 
Um, let me see if we can zoom in on this one on the bottom here. Um, now this pipe was originally coming across uh, Route 73 here and it was just dumping on the property. And now they're catching it in a manhole and they're piping it around the site to this location and dumping it at the edge of the wetlands. This basin also hooks into that same pipe and gets dumped at the end of the wetlands when it drains. Now, Cheryl wanted to know how deep the basin was. So let's see about that. There's this information here is probably where we're going to find that, but we'll have to zoom in with my magnifying glass here and see if I could see what it says and um, here we go. So it says the top of the basin is 88.75 feet. So that's an elevation. So that means it's 88.75 feet above mean sea level. And the bottom of the basin is 84.25 feet. So that means this basin is about four and a half feet deep. Okay. So if it's four and a half feet deep and you can see the topo here, 89, down to 85, you know, you can see how steep this is on the side. So my question here would be, well, what's the groundwater table here? And if the groundwater table is anywhere above 84.25, then the bottom of this basin is always going to be wet, which means there'll be mosquitoes in it, which means all these people in this senior facility, care facility are going to get eaten alive by mosquitoes on a regular basis. Um, so that would be one of my concerns. The other concern I had with this was that this underground basin drains right to the edge of the wetlands. Yeah. So all this extra stormwater is going into this wetlands. Even the water that's being diverted from Route 73 yeah. around the site is going there. So this is going to the wetlands. This one's getting all the way piped to the wetlands. So as an environmental commissioner, I tend to be concerned about that because you're dumping stormwater into the wetlands. So my question would be, um, is that water being treated before it gets there? Is it being cleaned anyway? Or are you just dumping dirty stormwater from the basin into the wetlands? Okay. What is a scour hole, Chris? Oh, so a scour hole, and there you see scour holes at the end of each of these, right? And, and one here. Um, it's basically uh, a hole that's about um, six to 12 inches deep and it's lined with riprap, the heavy duty angular stone. And what's meant to happen is that pipe is going to be discharging water very quickly. So it drops into that hole. The stone absorbs the energy, breaks up the water, slows it down, and then it slowly fills up that hole and overflows that hole and slowly makes its way out into that transition zone into the wetland. So it's a, it's meant to be a, a mechanism to prevent soil erosion. If you didn't have that, what would happen at these different locations is you would have erosion going all the way down out into this area because this water would be so concentrated, it would just erode the soil away until it gullied all the way out and it would be very dangerous and very, very messy. Um, Thanks. So Chris, you talked about the water coming, the stormwater runoff coming off of Route 73 and it's being diverted around and- Yeah, so this is, I mean, that's kind of one of my concerns. Now you see this this, this building or is dumping water into the basin at this end. Usually if the outlet's on one end of the basin, usually inlet's at the other end. So this is the inlet. At the end of this inlet, it's a little flared in section, which is a little concrete spillway basically. And the water kind of comes out here. And once again, that concrete slows the water down, doesn't cause any erosion. So the water can fill this basin up without eroding it away. But what Cheryl's talking about is this pipe was here originally. If we go back to the existing drawing, we can see it was here. But this manhole wasn't here. That manhole with the black manhole there, the little circle, um, that's been added. So that's something new. So instead of this water being dumped here onto the site, and slowly making it, which was okay from the highway. So it's being dumped on the site, right? It's slowly making its way through this whole development, right? Through all this land and eventually getting to the wetlands. So I imagine that water would be pretty clean by the time it got there, right? Now you're capturing it in this, in this pipe. You're piping it here, piping it here, and piping it right to the edge of the wetlands. So you're losing all this capacity to clean the water as it gets through that grassed area, that natural site area and you're piping it to a location. 
So my question is, well, that's unacceptable. That water needs to be cleaned in some way, shape or form. So I would ask the developer if they could put some sort of device in here to treat that water before it gets to this location from Route 73, Um, because basically he is developing the treatment mechanism, which was this land and replacing it with a pipe. So typically we would ask them to put in what's called a manufactured treatment device. And these are uh, basically, uh, there's two types. There's a concrete um, hydrodynamic separator, which we call the swirly system. Water comes in, swirls around, stuff settles out, sediment settles out, and then the clean water goes on its way. Or a filter system, which actually has filters in it, like a Brita filter would on a faucet, and water would pass through that filter system and get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner until it comes out the other end and be much cleaner. Then you would dump that into the wetland. So, I mean, so those would be things that I, I would ask for in this development because, you know, they're really uh, going to be contributing a lot of water from the highway into that wetlands. And that's not good for the wetlands. And Chris, which of those devices Whoa. require, sorry, which of those devices require less maintenance? Um, well, they both require maintenance. The, uh, the hydrodynamic separator only gets about 50% sediment removal. And basically, you think of a manhole with some baffles in it. You pop over the lid of the manhole and you vacuum it out once every three to four months. Um, usually, you want to clean it about once a year after you figure out how quickly it fills up. The other ones are filter devices. So um, once the filters get dirty, you have to take them out and clean them or replace them. Um, so the filter devices are probably a little bit harder, a little bit more expensive to maintain. Those devices also usually cost a little bit more money. Okay. So these aren't cheap features. They're very expensive features and developers going to push back if you ask them to do that. Um, but it, it's something that I would, I would have asked for if I was reviewing this on the, uh, on the environmental commission, I would have recommended the planning. See, we can't ask for anything. We can recommend to the planning board that they should ask for that. You know, that's how that works. So. And, and just remember, there's no test pits in that basin. Um, Chris, we have a question on the chat that says, when you say AD soils, are these horizons? No. Um, so, so, A, so, the, so the Soil Conservation District, um, I don't know how they did it, but they went through all of New Jersey and they classified all the soils and soil types. So based on that being the Addison fine sand, um, that's classified as an A or D soil. Um, so typically you got to remember the soil conservation district when they did this and the NRCS had done this work, natural resource conservation service, it was all tied to agriculture, right? So an AD soil would be, be a bad soil, D soil that's drained. So it would have tile drains underneath. So in other words, the water would pass through the corn and through the soil and get into these drains underneath that would take the water away. So the water would be very well drained. So the corn wouldn't be too saturated and would grow. So that would make a D soil into an A soil. If you didn't have those drains, it would be a D soil. Mm -hmm. So, so that's what concerns me. If basin A and basin B, these two basins that are under the parking lot are meant to infiltrate water into the ground, they're probably not going to work because the soil is type D. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you would know more about that from that soil testing. So when you think about soil horizons, you're really thinking about that soil testing data. So they, they basically they go out with a backhoe and they dig a pit and somebody climbs down in there and he, and, he, and he looks at the soil as it goes down deeper and deeper. And he says, oh, the first five inches of topsoil, the next 10 inches is a sandy loam. Uh, then we have uh, the seasonal high water table. We can tell by the discoloration of the soil and underneath that's a clay soil. So they, that's how they kind of classify it. And Based on those depths, we know how deep to make these basins and how much water we can infiltrate as engineers. But it's crucially important that those soil testing pits are in the location where you're putting your stormwater management features. Many times we've seen people put them other locations and say, oh, you know, we did a test pit in the back of the lot, but we're putting the the, uh, infiltration basin in the front of the lot. Well, that's unacceptable. You have to have it in the basin. And you have to have it down to the length of where you're building it. So if you did a pit, a soil testing pit or a log in in this front basin, 
you'd have to go at least eight feet deep because this is about a five foot deep system. So I would go several feet beyond that. If they only went down two or three feet here, I don't think that would be acceptable either. So you have to understand how deep it is. You know, that's another another factor of it. And, so and one, one of the things that Chris brought up um, that I really urge is knowing, it appears to us that this property was not developed before. Um, we don't know if it was used for agriculture. It's, we don't think so. But were there field drain tiles in place? Are they still there? And what's going to happen to those tiles? Because lots of times when these tiles are disturbed, they, they can um, cause flooding not only in other areas on the property, but also to adjacent properties. You, you really don't know where those tiles um, where those tiles yes. lead. And I think the other thing, Cheryl, is, is these, are, these are one thing that you're going to get for the, from the developer. You should probably also get an environmental impact statement that would discuss what the previous land use of the site was. Was it originally a farm? You know, did they used to park tractor trailers there and go to the diner across the street? You know, I mean, you get information like that, that might indicate to you, hey, wait a minute, there may be some oil here. You know, there may be some some uh, other sort of contamination here. Right. So it kind of gives you that understanding too. Also accompanied with this would be a stormwater plan, uh, uh, actually engineer's report, that talks about what management practices are putting and how they're supposed to work, you know, why they believe they're going to work, you know, and then all, all the engineering calculations, we're not really going to worry about, but that front end becomes very important. It talks about, you know, what they're trying to put in, what they're trying to accomplish, you know, and those are short reports. Usually they're not very, very long, but uh, it's important to take a look at that. So, um, so according to what we know now, the site is not already developed at all. Um, so would this development plan meet with the new stormwater management rule requirements that have recently um, become effective the beginning of this month? Anyone? Do they know about these requirements, Cheryl? Has Anjak educated them on this yet or no? Well, we have done some education on the new stormwater requirements. Okay. Um, as part of our green infrastructure presentations, but is let me just ask the question: Is everyone aware that there are new stormwater requirements that took effect? I think it was March second. March second, yeah. And what they and what they are, and the the question is: Would this meet those new requirements? And if and if not, why not? Anyone? Aren't they just supposed to meet green infrastructure um, requirements? If those can't be met, then they can go to structural stormwater management. Yeah. So the big the big difference with the new regulations and the old regulations are the same requirements. You still have to maintain 100 percent of your annual average groundwater recharge. So if this 10 acre lot was recharging a million gallons of stormwater a year before a development, afterwards you'd have to be recharging a million gallons of stormwater. You have to reduce the sediment that's washing off the um, the vehicle surfaces, so the the roadways, the parking lots. You have to reduce the sediment from those surfaces by eighty percent, and you have to manage it to the ten and the hundred year storm. Okay, but the new regulations say you have to do that with green infrastructure, and green infrastructure limits the amount of drainage area to each practice because what they want you to do is they want you to manage water more closely to where it lands so it doesn't travel across the ground and pick up pollution on its way to the management system so instead of having um this is a 10 acre site um the most you would be able to have drained to each of the green infrastructure practices would be two and a half acres so if I look at this, I would think, you know what, you probably have to change the management here in some way so you'd have smaller systems scattered throughout this development. So you may not be able to have this big basin. You may have to have a few more smaller ones like this spread around. And, and that's the big difference. Um, so you're going to think more of bioretention systems, which we often refer to as rain gardens because it's a nicer way of saying it, uh, sand filters, infiltration basins or porous pavement 
uh, those are the features you're really going to have. Now, if you can't do it with green infrastructure, you can ask for a waiver and go back to your traditional stormwater gray infrastructure or more detention basin kind of stuff. But um, I don't think there's going to be a lot of um, people who are going to allow you to do that because it's, it's going to be hard to get the, get those waivers. Okay. Okay. So we have 15 minutes. We're doing real good on time. And then okay. if, we, if we have time left at the end, we'll open it up for other um, for other questions. So now we're moving on to the to the landscaping plan. So using the plant schedule, what type of plants are being proposed? Wow. Okay. So this is the plant schedule on the bottom, and uh, I'll, I'll zoom in on it. The landscape plan is probably one of the most important plans I look at as an environmental commissioner because. I'm always worried about trees being cut down that don't need to be cut down or the ones that are cut down being replaced based on my tree ordinance in my town. But you can see, so this is the landscape schedule and planting schedule. Um, it has in here symbols for the trees. It has the number of trees, has the botanical name, the common name, which I love because I don't know botanical names that well. Um, the height of the tree that's being planted, the caliper, how thick the trunk is, and what kind of what kind of uh, packaging is it come in? So B and B is bald and burlapped. Uh, it talks about the mature height of trees and the spread of the tree when it gets mature. So these aren't always included in here. Um, these seem to be a little bit extra, the mature, mature height and, and mature spread. Um, but you can see the Acer Ruber, which is the uh, red maple, is AR. And when you go to the plan, you know you can see it has next to it the different names of the trees uh so here over here these are are ar now how do i know that well there's also a legend down here so this is the ar tree this is the cj tree which seems to be um i can't even say that word um this is the fp tree <laughs> with no so the, the fp tree is a problem because it's the green ash has anyone heard about the ash borer? <laughs> Because yeah. I guess I guess whoever developed these plants doesn't doesn't know that exists. So um, so if I'm going to plant seven green ashes, I, I want to be very careful because in two years, I'll probably have to come back and plant seven different trees to replace right. those. Um, so so these are the plants that they're planting. You have deciduous trees means the leaves drop. You have the evergreens, uh, Dawn Redwood, which is a very, very unusual pick. Um, Ornamental trees, uh, the river birch, which is one of my favorites, the red bud, another big favorite, sweet bay magnolia, really, really a hornbeam, very nice trees here. Uh, shrubs, they've got lots of shrubs here. Okay. Um, most of them look to be native. Um, they've got the endless summer hydrangea, which also is called deer food. Um, they do have the, Jap the spreading Japanese plum yew. Um, I, I question any plant that has Japanese in it, if that's really a native to the area. So I'd try to encourage natives. Um, Cheryl got really mad here because the perennials, they only had two. <laughs> Daylily and I don't know, whatever this one is. Uh, so, so, they, so they only had two of these. And now, so we're, we're in a, a um, you know, senior center here. And you're only going to have two flowering plants out here. I thought that was kind of crazy too. So right. anyway, so that was something we were kind of concerned about, but yeah, so that's your planting schedule. It's a really nice schedule. Um, the way it's laid out with the, with the, the codes and numbers, you know, they show what kind of trees they are. I have different symbols for each tree, you know, so you can look at it. So that one's this one. And, you know, you can really, really find your way through this pretty easily. Um, so other landscape legend over here, you know, so you could see the different types. Okay. Well, the and other, then, go ahead. The other thing you want to make sure of is the, um, the trees that are going in the wetland transition areas are, are they, will they um, survive there? Yeah. So, so we would look at this transition area here. And so, which is kind of all in here, all in here. Um, if we're going to be shooting out of here onto this tree, 
and try to figure out if these trees can handle that. I mean, I, I when I look at this uh, the schedule, I I can see that um, I know the red maple does very well in wet areas. Uh, the pin oak is another one that does very well. Uh, so those two I'd be comfortable with. Uh, the Dawn Redwood is also another one that does very good in uh, in a wetland or wetter areas. The River Birch does great too. Um, uh, you know, and, and even the Sweet Bay Magnolia and the Eastern Redbud do pretty well. You know, so there are some here that actually look like it can help absorb some of that water and clean some of that water. Um, the Red Ocean Dogwood is another one that's really nice. So that can really suck up a lot of water. So... The other thing, Cheryl, when we talk about trees being replaced, right? right. Wasn't that, that a was, question? That's the last question. Yeah. Do the proposed site tree plantings meet the ordinance requirements for the township? And uh, what about those being compensated? So does the township have a, a what's in their tree ordinance? I don't know what the ordinance says, but this is the table of removal stuff. So you have um, trees removed, protected zone, protection zone, five inch to 24 inches, 41 of those trees are going to be taken out. And the total caliper is 303 inches. So that means basically they figured out the average diameter of those 41 trees and it came out to be, you know, and multiplied it by 41, they came up with 303 inches. So they need to really add 303 inches of trees, right? So they're looking to do. Um, so down here, you can see number of compensatory trees required, 303 divided by three, 101 um, trees they need to replace it by. And it tells you this little footnote five, total number of inches divided by three, rounded up to the next whole number. So it tells you how they calculate it. So this stuff here is probably from the tree ordinance uh, in town that tells you how to calculate that. Um, the problem I have with this, though, is that um, they're going to provide 45 trees. Right. And then there's 58 that they're not going to provide. Right. So they got to provide 101, but they're really only providing 45. So I guess my question is, how come? You know, and uh, are you going to compensate the town for this other 50? I guess it's 56. This other 56 trees. Um, are you going to compensate the town for that? Uh, in my town, you have to contribute to the shade tree um, fund. And then we plant those trees other places. So I think that's a big question that comes up when I see these plans always about cutting down trees. Um, and we have, it's interesting, we have a bunch of environmental commissioners. There's one fellow who always asks about the trees. How many trees are you cutting down? How many are you replacing it by? Are you satisfying the tree ordinance? I mean, that's kind of his thing, you know. Uh, there's always a woman who asks about the wetlands, you know. Uh, tell me about the wetlands. You know, what kind of wetlands are they? And what, what kind of buffer do you have? And, you know, that kind of stuff. And do you have an LOI? So, uh, I always ask about the storm water because that's kind of kind of my thing, you know. So um, it, it, when you're on the Environmental Commission, you kind of find your niche a little bit, you know. Um, and what a lot of people do is, you know, there's a, my, my Environmental Commission, everybody doesn't show up all the time, you know. I'm actually one of the two alternates. Um, but when, you know, when one of the, the women who doesn't show up about the wetlands who usually asks about that doesn't show up somebody else jumps in and, and takes her lines and uses the same lines and that's the same thing you know so so we kind of kind of make sure we get the right questions asked as we're going through it um and that becomes really i think really important chris did you look at the with the um trees being planted i was answering what's that i was answering a phone on the phone with the text what's going on did you look at dutch town road the trees being planted there dutch town road over um over here yeah mm -hmm. is that dutch town road sure I, it must be because it's because um i have a note here that says that along dutch town road five large trees are required by ordinance however only two are proposed yeah, so there's two here that are 
proposed. Mm -hmm. So why do we think five are required? Well, that must be over here. Uh, maybe not. I don't, know. Yeah, I don't I don't see I don't see where I would say five are required. Mm -hmm. Randy um, must have um I don't know, she must have seen that somewhere. So these are all these are all landscape notes here, which is pretty interesting. You know, these are usually standard notes. They got different notes for the wetlands transition area too. So I don't really see here where it says anything right. about the number of trees, right? Right. But Randy says five are required. So why aren't they being planted? would right. be the question what what is dutch town road buffering on the other side of, of the road yeah, there's something there's something over here yeah right. that's already developed so um well and the other thing you have to be careful too is like like right here they've got a planting um near the entrance so if you're pulling out of here you want to make sure this doesn't obstruct your view um usually there's a sight triangle in here where you're not going to plant anything so you don't obstruct your view for the road and the sight triangles aren't shown on this drawing you know uh this tree also may be another one that may be obstructing your view if you're pulling out and you're looking up this way this tree could obstruct your view so you know so things like that you have to be very careful about when you're planting uh that's something the engineer should be looking at though and make sure they're not obstructing the view yeah there should be additional trees along this road there yeah. really aren't you know and i'm not sure why they don't have those so well, we finished all our questions and we still we have five minutes before we we go back to the breakout to the main room for like a minute just for like a minute so does anyone have any other questions that they would like to ask i see something in the chat yeah it's hard to look at the chat when we're doing this we usually have a third person but chris someone asked could you share that color coding again on the on the first map um, sure. There you go. Mimi, that was something that Randy put in. That was not put in by the applicant's engineer. No, that's fine. Because Sandy Batty always said that's really, a, a, it helps all of us, especially right. newbies like me, to just better understand the layout. That's what we were saying. It's a great way for the Environmental Commission to mark up their own maps when they're doing it. Yeah, you can use any colors. It depends what markers you have around you. <laughs> no, no, no. I know. But sometimes if it, it just makes sense. So it does. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Are there are there any I other have a question? Chris, Chris, um, and yeah. um this is um Eileen Reynolds from Little Silver, and I yeah. posted my question on chat. But I, we get a lot, because we're water, we have a lot of riverfront properties. Here. Right, right. Um, we get plans forwarded to us from the DEP primarily um, um, to look at for docks, bulkheads, things like that. And we're not, you know, we just wanted to make sure that we're looking at everything we should be looking at. Well, we yeah, get so, so for those, those plants, and so, so yeah. Eileen, what's interesting about that is anybody who's doing anything within the floodplain or right on a river, like a bulkhead, um, they really need to get a permit from New Jersey DEP. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, um, a flood hazard uh, permit they need to get. Um, and usually a, a, a wetlands permit. Um, they also need to, if it's coastal, then, then they need a, you know, a CAFR permit, which is a, a right. coastal zone permit. So, so if, if they're getting those permits from DEP, DEP is doing a good job of reviewing the information um, and as it pertains to that. So you probably don't have to worry too much about, you know, those features that are going in adjacent to the water. Um, now your town may want to think about um, what materials that stuff's being built out of. Yeah. Because there was some suggestion that the uh, stinging nettles that they keep seeing in Barnegat Bay, um, a lot of it's associated with the plastic bulkheads that are going on. They, they tend to attach to that. So huh. I, you know, I don't know if there's an alternative to that plastic bulkhead or not. Okay. Uh, you know, that may be a thing you might want to look at is the ecological impact of whatever they're putting in. Um, yeah, so that, that's about that's about it. But from the from the from the regulatory standpoint, the EP does a pretty good job of reviewing that. Now, if there's a if there's a big home going up, the EP will review the bulkhead. But you know, you still need to deal with the stormwater components of that 
house, you know, if it's if it's satisfying the major development criteria, which is right. disturbing mm -hmm. an acre or more, or adding more than a quarter acre of impervious cover. Um, so yeah, so that yeah, the title stuff is a, is a little bit tricky. We rely a lot more on DEP to to know what they're doing on that because there's not a lot that we can we can do with that. So. Because those are plans that are always specifically sent to this environmental commission for review right. directly from the DEP. So, yeah. um, I, you know, I just wanted to make sure we weren't missing something. <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, but thank you very okay. much. Okay. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And um, if you have any other questions, please just email us at info at .org. These recordings of um, all the sessions, all the commissioners' courses we're picking one from each because we did each one twice will be on Ann Jack's YouTube um, channel. So you can review everything there and thank you so much for serving in your communities. Um, and we hope you'll attend some more future sessions and thank you to Chris Abrupta. Did a great job. No problem. Okay. Yeah. Just remember Ann Jack's a great source, you know, I'll tell you, I mean, a great, great place to go ask questions. I mean, if, if anything's going on in your town and you're not sure what to do about it, Anjax heard it someplace else <laughs> and, and they could, they could tell you what to do and more importantly, what not to do, <laughs> you know, to stay out of trouble. So that's, that's really, that's really crucially important, you know? So I rely on them quite a bit. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Good night. We're not going thank back you. to the main room. Okay? Great. okay. We're just done. Okay. Yeah, we're done. Good. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Bye -bye. thank you. Thank you very much. Saturday. What else we got? <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thanks so much for coming by. We'll share the recordings with you all as soon as we have them. Good night, everybody. Take care. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. We'll see you. We'll send you the recordings. All right, this is all my group coming back. So I was I was chatty Kathy and chatty with Kathy tonight. So thank you everybody for being with us tonight. We're we're finished for this evening. So go enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you for being with us. Um, and all these sessions will be posted on YouTube at Anjack Views. So um, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye everybody. Good night. Bye. That was perfect timing because my computer is going to die in 24 minutes after <laughs> being on Zoom and talking for two hours. <laughs> Liz, I have a question. I didn't stop recording my break. Hi, Jane. Week. Thank you so much for being with us. Cheryl, you, Cheryl, Cheryl, you don't have to. What's, what's Liz? Okay, the that's meeting? fine. No. I just want to make sure I didn't have to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Once I end the meeting, it'll all end. So. All right, we've got a few people who are still on who maybe don't know how to close out. Um, but thank you everybody for doing this. This was certainly a whirlwind this year with, um, you know, it's usually a whirlwind of Saturdays, <laughs> uh, three Saturdays and bagels at 6.30 a.m. and all that business. But this was a different kind of whirlwind this year. So thank you everybody for, I mean, really great, great team effort for showing up. It was a lot easier a second time. So. Now, now that I trained Cheryl all up, I think she's ready to go, she's ready to go alone. Is you ready to hit the road? <laughs> okay, guys, have a great all night. All right, thanks. Thank I'm going to go open a bottle of wine. And Good night, everyone. Great job, Jen. Have a good one. Thank you. Right, thanks, bye -bye. everybody. Bye. 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 Well, the breakout rooms went well. Oh, yeah, I think it went well. I think we, right. we did a good job. I think it went well. Michelle, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm you. <laughs> she gave a shrug. That I hope I did okay, Randy. And didn't. oh, it was fine. I know I, I kind of, I, I know I kind of went in there because I looked at these plants so much. I'm like, I know them by heart by now. But <laughs> <laughs> I get chatty and I tend to go slow through the maps <laughs> and really try to analyze them and walk people through. So I, I'm not covering all of the maps even for Evesham, and that happened both sessions. Um, Deanie kept me a little bit more on task this time than last, so I got further along, but um, I really 
try to explain for the newbies. So uh, there's there's no freaking way I could do two site plans in one session. No, no. no and I, don't think, I think that's fine. Yeah. I yeah. think, you know, I, I think you have to kind of go with the, what the crowd is. Giving. One site plans, but you would mm -hmm. never make it through that you'd be rushing too much. I would right. bore myself as well. <laughs> and, and I don't think they would feel like they had the opportunity to ask questions they wanted to, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they ask a lot of questions and everything, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, we had a ringer. Who I don't know who that woman was, but oh, it was Kathy Cacavelli. Oh, really? That's um, who you had her. The in. Land Conservancy. Yeah. Oh, what a ringer! Whew, that woman knows stuff. Yeah. You should do yeah. this next time. <laughs> yeah, we but a lot of our people in our room weren't really engaging that much. I mean, they were answering some questions here and there, and there, there was one person that yeah, was- Yeah, there was like no uh, chat. There was like nobody chatting. Like last yeah. time there were a lot of people, this time there- Yeah, it's just, you never know what the group is gonna be like. Yeah, maybe- yeah, they were kind of more laid back and just wanted just to show them things. Cause I think a lot of, maybe a lot of people are just, you know, unfamiliar with them. I don't know. Right, it's, yeah, right. And, and, we, and we also, somebody did say that it would be nice to have the plans ahead of time. Yeah. So, you know. Sure. to look at before before right. we can think goes. about that for next time i mean at one point in time i think i did have to say anybody any like let me know you're awake <laughs> but i think we had i saw the chat number going up i try not to pull it up because then it's just too many things on my screen we had like 24 25 different chat messages like people were engaging yeah 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 we didn't well, have that many we had like maybe 10 but people were asking questions you know yeah that's true that's the same with us there yeah. are more talking than right chat. that's yeah, cool you know, i mean that whatever way it goes different that yeah. way right yeah. yeah yeah okay all right everybody have a good right, time for a glass of wine and yeah. then i'm gonna wake up and work on niff with uh, <laughs> <hey. laughs> more niff with <laughs> thanks Bye, everybody, everybody. Have a good good one. Bye. 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 Bye.